be the same again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Nikki. <laughs> Generally, I tend to choose topics that are a little bit complicated or, you know, um, debate, debated. And so this time I thought I'll do a really easy one, one that, um, like, you know, everyone would agree on. And then I thought I had another clever idea, and I said to my ladies on a Wednesday morning, like, look, why don't you all, you know, each of you do a bit of a study on, on that topic. And I thought, like, goody, you know, they're doing the research for me. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of inspiration, but the, the problem was that they did their job too well, and then when they came up with all their different studies, it was just so amazing, so, so multifaceted, that I, it confused me even more than before. <laughs> so the topic for, like, you'll see what I mean, the, it's forgiveness. Seems a, an easy enough topic, but once you get into it, there are so many angles that you can take, and it's actually so involved. And there are some, some areas where people are divided um, over, yeah, over the specific um, thing. So, like, this morning, I'm... Um, won't be preaching too long either because apparently I've got to watch it here. <laughs> two, two minutes down, it's o'clock. Um, <laughs> but I'll, what I'll do this morning is I'll give you some basics, and I think these are really important basics for, for forgiveness. Now, everyone knows we should be forgiving, and it's in the Bible, so that's not the, you know, that's not an issue. Nelson Mandela, he was a South African apartheid activist. He ended up in prison for 27 years, and he had a lot of people to forgive, but as he was released from prison, and he, he lay, wrote a memoir, but in his memoir he said, as I walked out of the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. In prison. So he understood that. Um, not forgiving does something to yourself. Like, if you don't forgive, it keeps you in a prison, um, and it keeps you from moving on with your life. Now, the Bible talks a fair bit about forgiveness, and Jesus talks about forgiveness in, May uh, in Matthew 18. In Matthew 18, like, if you want to follow it on your Bibles, I didn't, have, I didn't put it up on overhead. So it's Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Um, Peter came to Jesus at that point, and he said to Jesus, like, Lord, how many times should I forgive uh, my brother or sister who sinned against me up to seven times? And Jesus said, I tell you not seven, but 77 times. And the one question I had was, what, why these specific numbers? Have any, any of you looked into that? Some translations don't say 77, but 70 times, seven times, so 490. Um, and the, the reason for that is it depends what, um, like Jesus is actually quoting an Old Testament passage, and depending what Old Testament version translation you use, it's, it can be, can be either. But in the end, it doesn't make a lot of difference. But he's quoting an Old Testament text, um, Genesis 4, 24, and these numbers, 7 and 70 time, uh, 77, are used in the context of God um, protecting a person who has killed another person, or God, basically God forgiving them and still looking after them. Now, the Jew Jewish teaching at the time was that you had to forgive a person three times if they offended you for the same offense. And after three times, like, you could let it go. So Peter here thinks he's being pretty generous if he says, like, look, uh, I'll forgive a person seven times. Is that enough? But then Jesus basically says, no, 77 times. And what he means is, um, like, if you forgive a person once, like, you can always remember one offense. You, like, three offenses, you can still remember that. And you're probably at a point where you kind of go, oh, look, look, dude, you've done this for the third time, like, that's it. But if you forgive seven times, um, I have to forgive seven times. I think you have to keep starting writing things down. So first time he did that, second time he did that. But if you do it 77 times, it kind of becomes a habit. Like, you don't know exactly what the person has done unless you've actually written it down. 
So what Jesus is saying here is, like, look, forgiving should actually be an attitude. It's not just, you know, you forgive a few times, you remember what they've done, but you just should keep on forgiving. Martin Luther King said, forgiveness is not an occasional act, it's a constant attitude. So he knew that too. So then uh, Jesus goes on in that passage and he tells a story, and I'll paraphrase, but he says, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like a king, and he wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now this one servant comes to, comes to the king, and he um, owed him 10,000 bags of gold. And so, uh, but, but he can't pay it back. So the king says, like, look, we'll sell your wife, we'll sell your children, we'll sell everything you have, and you, you pay me back. So the servant falls to his knees, and he begs him, be patient with me, I'll pay everything back. And the master, what he does is he says, look, it's okay, like, I'll forgive you, you won't have to pay anything back. So that guy goes out, and then he has a fellow servant who owed him a hundred, let me see, a hundred silver coins, and a hundred silver coins are about four gold coins, and so remember, like, that guy owed 10,000 bags of gold coins, so there's no comparison. And he refuses to forgive him. He kind of goes, oh, you, you, like he takes him, he shakes him, and he throws him into prison. The master hears, and the master then calls that servant and says, look, I've forgiven you all that money, uh, and you can't even forgive a little bit of debt that your servant owes you. And so he says, um, in his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. So here he's also linking forgiveness with a prison. And the jailers, like the original word, um, I think I even have it up there on the next slide, uh, Bazanistas, these were actual prison guards, the name for prison guards back then, whose job it actually was not only to lock people up, but to torture them to get out information. So it's a pretty awful thing. <laughs> Jesus finishes with, um, so this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, and when you read that, it sounds pretty harsh. It sounds a little bit like God is this ha harsh, harsh guy. And so he throws you into prison if you're not forgiving anyone else. Like he'll lock you into prison to, to be tortured. But that, that is not really the word that is being used um, the word for handing over is paradidomi, and it means like to surrender someone. You kind of have to let someone go who is really close beside you. You're protecting them, and then you actually have to let them go. It comes with a sense of reluctance. It's more like a grieving parent that allows their kids to suffer the, the consequences of their own choices. Now, in inner healing ministry, we quite regularly, pretty much every time, um, we come across the fact that unforgiveness is a major block to healing. Um, and it's not only a major block to emotional healing, but also physical healing very often. Donna De Silva, she's one of the main... Oh, I wanted to take a sip, sorry. <laughs> I knew I wanted to do something. <laughs> So Donna De Silva, she is one of the main leaders of the Bethel Inner Healing Ministry, and she says um, that no one else has the key to your jail cell but, but yourself. So when we have been hurt, um, we, our thinking often is, like, why should I forgive? I'm not the one who did that. You know, why, why should I have to do that? And somehow we learn that we are making the other person pay when we hang on to unforgiveness. Like, look at me, look at how miserable I am, and it's all your fault. And we learn that from other people, um, like, you know, when we grow up. Maybe, you know, like, for instance, you may have had a friend or a parent who gave you this, the silent treatment and didn't forgive you, and so you learn that um, not forgiving actually punishes the other person. So I've got a good example for that one. Oh, some, some psychologists, by the way, I found, back that up. And there's one um, researcher from Adelaide 
and he says that according to some of the research they did, it seems to be a lot easier for people to forgive someone if it comes with some form of punishment. That means if uh, either the victim gets to punish that person, or if, 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 if it's a court of law, or if something horrible happens to them, then the person seems to be um, more likely to forgive. And the reasoning these researchers give is that um, when we get hurt, we feel vulnerable. And when we have to forgive, it makes us, it makes us feel even more vulnerable. Um, and I don't know, like, is that true? Do you find it easier to forgive someone if something horrible happens to them? <laughs> I don't know, maybe it does make someone feel a, li a little bit empowered, but w what's the difficulty with that approach? What, what's the issue with it? You think you're letting them off the hook? Yes. Exactly. A bad thing might not happen to them. What, what if what they've done is so horrible that you know there is no adequate punishment, like Holocaust survivors? Is there adequate punishment for for those guys? Or what um, if that person doesn't even think of you, like, or they don't care about the punishment? Um, so it's entirely dependent on other circumstances. Like it actually does disempower us if we have to wait for some sort of some sort of punishment before we can forgive. And so yeah, the example I have is um, like because it was I, when we started dating, I this one time I went over to Edgar's house and went up the stairs and I saw like his dad come down, didn't say a word, and I said, oh, what's going on? He's like, oh no, my dad's giving me the, the silent treatment. And what happened when he was a teenager, or a little bit older then, um, like, they were both very strong-minded, and so Edgar and his dad, they often had conflict. And uh, his dad would respond by giving him the silent treatment, often for two weeks. So, so he wouldn't speak to him at all, um, which made it really uncomfortable for everyone else in the house. <laughs> but the thing is, Edgar didn't really care because he said, like, doesn't that bother you? And he says, no, it's actually really good. I, don't, I can go about my own business. I don't have to talk to my dad. <laughs> So he wasn't bothered. The only person that was bothered by it was his dad. <laughs> so it does not work. Uh, Donna says when she was teaching at a high school, um, she gives an example and she says there was this, uh, this mom brought her daughter for, for ministry and the daughter didn't really want to be there. What, she would have been, what, 16, 17 maybe. And the problem was that dad drank, and he was not a nice drunk, so he wasn't nice to, to the girl, and the girl didn't like the dad, and she said, oh, I don't like my dad when, when he drinks, but she said, I don't care, I don't want to forgive him, I want nothing to do with this, and so, you know, like, it took a little while, she, she had to keep coming back, but then at one point, Donna said, like, look, if you don't want to forgive your dad, that's fine. Um, but if you want to leave the session, you need to be able to forgive someone, um, find something to forgive. And so the girl is like, um, okay, fine. Um, my brother took my bike and then he parked it in the garage the wrong way, so it was harder to get out. So I forgive him for that. You're happy now? <laughs> and she got up and left. And Donna said, well, I told her she could leave. So. But the thing was, she came back the following, time, uh, following session and she said, I don't know what happened, but I had the best weekend with my brother, like we haven't had such a weekend in years. And she realized that forgiving did actually something good for her. And so that then helped her eventually forgive her dad. And I thought like even, so for one thing, forgiving is something that we do for ourselves, but also, uh, so like that's a really clever um, approach. Like if you if there's someone you really can't forgive, start with something easier. Start with a person um, or something that you actually can forgive, and then when you experience the relief for that, it's often a little bit easier to take the next step and forgive someone else. Um, okay, Saint Augustine. He was one of the we call them church fathers or early theologians. What was it? Fourth century? Pardon? <laughs> he, 
He said uh, to withhold forgiveness is to take poison and expect the, the other person to die. Um, making the point unforgiveness actually hurts us and not necessarily the offender because they may not even care. So what is forgiveness? And you've probably heard the phrase forgive and forget. Um, that phrase is actually not in the Bible and it's, it's also not what forgiveness is. Forgiving does not mean that we forget what happened. It does not mean that we excuse what someone did. It does not mean we pretend we weren't hurt by it. It also does not mean that we have to trust that person again or that we are ever going to have the same relationship with them again. Like sometimes the offense may not be that big and we can re-establish uh, re-establish the relationship and repair it and it's fine. But if it's a bigger thing, we may not ever be you know, in the same type of relationship. Many of the Holocaust survivors, I mean, they, they had to forgive horrific, horrific things. They learned that they had to forgive to be able to move on with their lives, but they never had anything to do with the perpetrators again. Um, what forgiveness is, it's a choice. It's a choice to give up the desire to see the other person punished. And that's where I disagree with uh, with the study that um, forgiveness and, and punishment kind of need to go together because I think we're disempowering ourselves. Um, it's a choice that we can make. Um, it's a choice to let go of the bitterness and anger that holds us back from moving forward. Now, forgiveness has a huge impact on different areas of our lives. Peter Horobin, he was the founder of LL Ministries. It's another inner healing ministry. And he said it affects three things. And like I won't be able to go into detail in all of those points, just mention them. And the first one is it affects our feelings. Hang on, flying in. Our feelings, our thinking, and our reactions, like it does when we carry wounds, we react in certain ways that um, are triggered by those wounds. And secular studies actually show um, that people that do forgive on a regular basis, they, uh, they are happier, they're more fulfilled, they're often more successful in life because people pick up on if you're an angry person, no one wants to employ an angry person, for instance. So you're more likely to be successful in life. It affects our physical body, and it has, again, it has been shown by studies that uh, unforgiveness can raise stress levels, results in high blood pressure and depression and anxiety, um, in heart disease, all sorts of things. And in prayer ministry, we have seen that people that present with um, certain conditions that seemingly have absolutely nothing to do with forgiving a person all of a sudden it goes when that person has forgiven a deeper hurt. And Peter Horobin, like they, in their ministries, they've seen numerous, um, they, can, they have numerous examples. And he says there was, for instance, I gave a conference and there was this one woman, Olga, she was, uh, grew up in Russia and uh, she, was she had an abusive childhood, like she was raped by Russian officers then she married an American soldier, moved to America. She um, had scoliosis of the spine and was basically in constant pain. And she um, well, went to church, became a Christian, and it started attending his conferences. And she was sitting in the conference and she heard about the possible connection between not forgiving someone and being in pain. And so she's starting to think, oh, maybe you know, my condition has something to do with unforgiveness. And no one even prayed for her. She was just sitting there and she started by herself, started to forgive um, those um, officers that had raped her. And as she did that, she said she, she literally felt her spine straightening and the pain was gone from then on. Another lady, um, he mentions another lady, Frida. Now, she came from Rwanda, and for those of you who are a little bit older, I don't know if, if you remember uh, 1994, there was the Rwandan genocide, which meant there were a particular group 
um, people group, the Hoodoos and the Hoodoo militia, they massacred, um, some records say, up to a million um, Tutu, like a minority, ethnic minor minority group. And her family belonged to the Tutus, and they were captured by the, by the militia, and they were asked uh, how they would like to die. <laughs> And because they were poor, they couldn't afford a bullet, which would have been quick. And so they chose to die by machete. And she, Frida, had to witness how 15 of her family members were killed um, by machete. And she was hit with it too. Um, she was lying among the corpses, but she wasn't dead. So she was crying out and someone a little bit later picked her out and she left and went to America and there again she became a Christian and she learned about forgiveness and she said she um, went, even went back like to her homeland, she went to prison where she met the guy who'd done that to them and she forgave him like verbally and she said it totally changed her as a person mentally, emotionally but the thing that it didn't quite change was like the pain at the back of her neck where she was hit was still there, and so she came to one of those conferences and someone prayed for her, and what they prayed was that Jesus would come into her, um, into her memories, like the memories that she'd pushed down and, and couldn't remember, and would bring healing to these memories, and as they did that, she said she went to bed that night, the next morning she woke up and the pain was completely gone from then on. So this is where prayer ministry comes in. Sometimes God heals completely all in one sitting, but sometimes it needs a little bit more work to work through like the deep-seated issues. So number three, and I want to spend a little bit of time on that, is it affects our relationship with God. Now our passage in Matthew says that we are removed from God's side, like from his protection. Um, and so something happens in the relationship. Artie Candle, he's a pastor and Christian writer. He says that forgiveness connects us more deeply with God when we forgive, but unforgiveness can create a barrier between the individual and God. The question is, uh, to what extent does it create a barrier between us and God? Can it actually affect our salvation? Like in that, pas uh, in that um, Bible story in Matthew, does prison... Prison refers to, well, obviously, you know, we, if we are imprisoned by our own negative thinking, by our own negative reactions, but does it also refer to, you know, hell? Does it refer to being totally separated from God? And theologians and pastors have totally different opinions on that, so it wasn't very helpful. One guy says, unforgiveness causes many believers to miss out on the blessings God has for them, but he says... While unforgiveness can be a major issue, it cannot cause you to lose your salvation. So, and then I came across this, or I remember this testimony. It's an older one um, from 2001 about this guy, a Nigerian pastor who had a near-death experience. Oh, no, he actually died. He, it wasn't, he, he died. He was dead for three days. Um, so I'll tell you his story, and I want to... So you may have heard the um, testimony before, but I want to hone in on a few aspects. So this happened in November 2001, and he had a, um, he had a fight with his wife, Nika, and at the end of it, she slapped him, and he was hor horrified, like he was really offended, and he wouldn't speak to her. So she tried to apologize, make up a few times, but he just wouldn't have any of it. So he left the next day or two days later, and he said uh, on the way he kept thinking about how he would put his wife into place, into her place when he came home. So as he is driving home, the brakes of his 20-year-old Mercedes failed, and the car crashed into a concrete pillar, and he hit the steering wheel really, really hard. He started coughing up blood. And one bystander saw what happened. He pulled him out. He took him to the nearest hospital. At the hospital, he was um, looked at immediately. But he realized, like, it wasn't doing anything. And he was about to die. 
So he called for his wife and she came and he gave her instructions to look after the, I think they had two boys, and to look after the church. And then he said he wanted to be transferred to another hospital because his personal doctor was practicing there. And so they put him in the ambulance and he said in the ambulance he saw two massive angels and they were so big that he later wondered how they'd actually fit in the ambul ambulance. And he said they were totally white, even the pupils of their eyes were white. So anyway, he sees them, and he wanted to say something to his wife, who was with him in the ambulance, but one of the angels motioned him to be quiet, and so he, was, he didn't say anything. They, he said they lifted his spiritual body out from, from the shoulders, and off he went. Um, they took him to heaven, and there he saw the mansions, and he was told the mansions are ready for the saints, but the saints are not ready. He saw multitudes worshipping, and he thought there were angels because they looked all shiny and white, but he was told, no, they're actually you know, people that worship uh, God. And then he was taken to hell, and he said the gates of hell opened, and he heard screaming. And every person, he says, was tra trapped in their own personal torment. The angel, angel told him that the people were reaping what they sowed. Their sins on earth became their torment in hell. And then he said, like, look, Dan uh, Daniel, if the book of your life would be closed today, this is actually where you would stay. And he's like, no, no, they're, they're comfy. Look, I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. I've been preaching all over the place. And the angel replies, Enough, Daniel, on the way to the first hospital. Like, you were asking God for forgiveness, but you wouldn't forgive your wife. Even then, he wouldn't. Um, and the angel says, you cannot sow unforgiveness to your wife and reap, uh, reap forgiveness from God. And Daniel says, like, it sounds really harsh, but Daniel says, I immediately knew, knew it was true. Like, I, yeah, I really held on to the grudge and uh, asked God to forgive me, but I wouldn't forgive my wife. So what do you think of this? Like you hear it, you kind of go, well, he was a Christian, he was a pastor. We're saved by, by faith alone, aren't we? Jesus says, uh, I, and, you know, like, I'll be honest, I'm not sure that I'll give you a, an answer either way, but I'll just put it before you. Um, Jesus says in Matthew uh, 6, without my glasses, I think that's Matthew 6, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, um, neither will your Father forgive you. And there's Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And like I said, people are different theologians that I really respect have different opinions on it. John Piper says, if the forgiveness that we have received at the cost of the blood of Jesus, if it means so little to us that we're holding on to our unforgiveness, then um, we are not a good tree and we are not saved. He says, and he says, struggling to forgive, that's not the issue. The issue is if we hold on to our grudge like we nurse it and we, we are not going to let go, you know, like we are going to punish that other person. And he says that kind of bitterness in us, like it affects us, it sh shapes us as a person. And that is the issue. Um, Peter Horobin, like the guy from the Inner Healing Ministries, he also says um, sowing and reaping is actually a spiritual law. What we send out comes back to us, and so when, when we send out unforgiveness, this is what will come back to us. So luckily for Daniel, that's not where the story ended. Um, so he uh, asked the angel... Uh, he asked the angel to, to be able to go back and to warn other people. And the angel said, well, look, the, that request is granted and he's being sent back. Um, but what happened in the meantime, when Daniel died in the, in the ambulance, his wife, and you really got to give it to his wife, she was persistent. She wouldn't accept it. And she said... Um, she took him to another hospital because she said, no, you're, you're not dead. Like, and she said God had promised her at some point, given a Bible passage, that a family would be okay. Um, and so she stood on that Bible passage. And so she takes 
the corpse from the ambulance, puts him in, in the car, drives him to another hospital to be examined, and they write a death certificate, and they send the body to a morgue. So now the mortician, he starts injecting balm in, uh, balming fluid in his fingertips, and I think the, the feet, and he's about to cut uh, into his thigh for a bigger tube for more embalming fluids, and he gets an electric shock and is pushed back, and he tries again, it happens a second time. So the guy who's not a Christian, he thinks this guy is maybe part of a really, um, uh, of a big sect, a powerful sect, and these are evil spirits, so he doesn't want to touch the body. And he says, like, then he sees light coming from the face of the, of the corpse, so that freaks him out. So he leaves it, he leaves for the night, and he lives close by, um, but he hears worship music coming from the morgue. So as he approaches, it stops. Uh, and again, it happens twice. And by that time, he's so freaked out that he says to the family, can you please come and pick the body up? I don't want it anymore. Um, so they come and take it. And the same night, Nika, like Daniel's wife, has a dream. And in the dream, her husband speaks to her and says, well, why did you put me in the morgue? I'm not dead. I want you to take me to, there was a conference, Reinhard Bonnke, if you've heard, like he was a powerful German evangelist in Africa. So he gave a conference. And uh, so in the dream, he says, take me to the conference. And Nika convinces the family, we, I, I want to take the corpse to the conference. They go like, yeah, come on, <laughs> you're a little bit nuts. Um, but she's insistent, and so they buy a coffin, put the body in. By that time, he'd been dead three days. Rigor mortis had set in, like it was totally stiff. But they put him in, they drive to the conference. They're security guards, and they won't let them in because they think there's explosives in the casket. So <laughs> she eventually, she, she won't leave. So they open the casket, see the dead person. They kind of make fun of her, abuse her, but eventually... One of the pastors says, like, look, bring him into the basement, not upstairs where, where all the preaching is going on, the basement. And some pastors and attendees, like, they start praying for him. And it wasn't just a quick prayer. They keep praying for a while, but eventually they started the corpse moving. <laughs> and they, keep it, they keep praying, keep praying, and eventually, like, he's regaining consciousness Apparently, it took a few hours for him to be completely there. Um, there was a, which I didn't, I hadn't heard before, there was a bit of a backstory to that too, because Reinhard Bonnke, a few days early, like he had been wondering if his, um, if his uh, ministry was finished in Africa, and he was asking God, can you give me a sign if I'm supposed to move to America or still stay here? And so this is what he prayed a few days before the conference. So then he preaches at the conference, and he hears people go, uh, all of a sudden shouting, he's breathing, he's coming back to life. And so I think that was a good sign for him to kind of go, no, I still have a ministry here in Africa. So do we risk our salvation if we persistently refuse to forgive someone? And I'm probably not going to give you an answer. You can make up your own mind. Um, like I said, a lot of theologians are div divided on that. I think, like Daniel would say, like according to, I, I do believe his testimony, and I think at the very least what it tells us is that we have to be very cautious if we want to keep holding a grudge or want to keep holding on to unforgiveness. Like it does something to us and it does something to the relationship with God. Um, but what I also liked about that testimony is that God is a good God. He's a kind God. And you can actually tell that he was working behind the scenes. He, his plan was not for Daniel to end up in hell. And it's not, for, it's not his plan for any of us to, to end up in hell. So what he did is he already organized everything. Like he, you know, he spoke to the mortician, like made sure that the body wasn't like cut into anymore. He gave the wife a dream that made sure that she would take him to the conference. He knew that people would pray for him and that he would eventually come back to life. 
And he wanted him to share that testimony so that we are aware how unforgiveness has actually a really big effect on our lives. And it is really not always easy to forgive, but the beneficiaries, that's us. So I want to finish by making it really, it's 35 minutes, look. <laughs> I want, to make, I want to finish by making it very practical. Um, I don't know if there's someone you still need to forgive. Like Usually, you, know, you may forgive everyone in your life that you have forgiven, but there's always some new offense. So if there's something at the moment, if not, then just follow the steps and remember for next time. But like I said, forgiveness, forgiving is not always easy. C.S. Lewis said, uh, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. <laughs> But it is a choice, it's not a feeling. And according to psychologists, it's actually also a skill that we can learn. So it is something that can become a habit. So there are some practical steps that I think can make it a little bit easier for us to get to the point of forgiving. And the first one is, and I want to lead you through that, is to accept the past. Like the what, what's happened has happened. Like, it's no use mulling over it. Um, we can't undo what has happened. So to accept that. So if there's something that is on your mind, so like, I'll just give you a brief moment, and maybe you can remember, like, something that happened to you that you want to let go. So in order to do that, either speak it out aloud or do it quietly and kind of go, you know, understand that what happened to me then like blah, 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 it can't be undone, I accept that. And the next step is to acknowledge your emotions, like stuffing them down is really not going to help because they'll pop up at some point again. Um, so really what you want to do is to, to kind of even or speak it out like, actually, I feel hurt or I'm angry at blah, 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 because he did this to me or said this to me. Number three is like you shift perspective. And shifting perspective means like you're trying to see the situation from the other person's point of view, and it doesn't mean that, um, it doesn't mean, it, it just means that you're letting go of your assumptions because you only see it from your point of view, but it doesn't necessarily, doesn't mean that you agree with what happened or you agree with the other person or approve of it, but it does mean that, you know, sometimes you realize what they did to you had nothing to do with you in the first place. Um, abusers, uh, abused people often become abusers, not always, but often become um, abusers themselves because this is what they've learned. So maybe whatever that person did to you is what they've learned in childhood and they just passed it on and it had initially nothing to do with you. And it just helps to be aware of that. So shift perspective, try and you know, describe the, the, um, the behavior and reflect on why they might have done what they did. And the last one is take responsibility and we often blame the other person for feeling the way we do. You kind of go like, yeah, look at me, I'm so miserable because you did this to me. But really, it's our responsibility how we feel. Like initially someone may you know, hurt you and you feel hurt, but to actually keep holding on to that hurt, there is a choice. Um, we d if we're nursing our emotions, we can take steps to you know, take charge of our emotions as well. So no one else can make you feel the way you do. And we are not responsible for anyone else's feelings either. Uh, you know, like we're not supposed to, you know, be hurtful to someone, but everyone is responsible for the way they feel. So we may think about ways of managing our emotions, and that does include, like, maybe limiting the time with people that are negative influence in our life or uh, play, putting up boundaries and spending time with people that are good for us. Um, doing something we enjoy. So, like, step four would be, you know, speak it out, I take responsibility for feeling angry, and instead I actually want to feel, I want to feel happy again, and take steps towards that. So, I don't know if you have a person in mind, but if you do, 
picture them. If you find it hard to forgive them, ask God or the Holy Spirit to help you with that. And so I want to lead you through the prayer, like other do it quietly, or like I'll speak it out, you can speak it out aloud with me, or do it quietly. So if you want to forgive someone, go, Father God, I ask that you forgive me for bearing a grudge against, name the person. I choose to forgive that person for, fill that in. What I needed from them was, it may have been a safe home. I forgive them for not providing what I needed and I release them from my judgment. And Father God, I ask you to take away my bitterness and heal my wounds so that I can live in freedom. And you set the other person free too. Amen. So at the end of the service, there will be people up here praying for you, like if there's you know, some follow-up work that, or you would like some prayer, then please come up. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his, fa may he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Have a lovely Sunday.